Bonjour et bienvenue à la table ronde en sortant de la France. Et en remerciant, je remercie, je commence par remercier tous les partenaires de Les Fictions. Et je vous, j'avertis maintenant les auditeurs que nous allons passer en anglais. So, welcome to the uh, panel discussion that is titled Reboot or Reset, an International Perspective. And I'm starting by thanking all of the partners of Nice Fiction who are supporting this uh, worthwhile initiative. This is a panel that is right in the uh, right on the theme of the entire Nice Fiction Festival, that is to say the reboot, one of the main theme for 2020. And so today we have international guests. Um, including myself because I am due to uh, technical difficulties playing the role of both moderator and guest. So I may at times both launch questions at the panelists and answer them myself. But first, we'll uh, go around the table, the virtual table, and ask everybody to introduce themselves, starting with uh, our Belgian writer, Guillaume Lafinard. Oh, hello everyone, I'm Guillaume Lafineur. I live in Brussels. Um, I've started writing about five years ago, so I'm a much younger writer, let's say, than uh, my, co uh, um, my colleagues. Um, I studied uh, philosophy for about five years uh, at the University of Brussels, and then moved on to uh, the music instrument business. Uh, voila. And so I've been published in uh, Galaxy for uh, past three years, and I've sent a uh, short story for um, the This Fiction Festival, uh, which was uh, scheduled to be released in an anthology, uh, which will be, I think, delayed uh, to last year, uh, to next year, sorry. Um, and the team was uh, obviously the reboot or a reset. And then turning to our Japanese guest, Tayo Fuji. Yeah. yeah, thanks for introducing me. I am inviting me to the niche fiction at this round table. I'm a science fiction writer, started to write in seven years ago. I am a young writer. But uh, fortunately, my second work, Orbital Cloud, won the Japanese uh, three science fiction awards and the uh, Many persons think that I should assume the chief of the science fiction writers associated in Japan. Then uh, I the assumed of three years of the science the, the president uh, chair of the SFWJ for uh, for uh, until the second last year. And the during the uh, during this year, the, these years, I wrote several novels about uh, political fiction and the geo political fiction or the, uh, the space uh, space uh, development space development or the uh, or the social future the social system of the uh, future of the social systems and then. Last year, I won the Japanese Mainstream Literature Award with uh, with Hello World. Uh, this is a story about the uh, freedom of the internet in the next decade. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, we uh, and I uh, I was uh, often uh, invited to the Chinese and other countries uh, uh, this <coughs> event, and uh, I'm very uh, happy to meet with my colleagues and the friends at this, uh, at this table. Thank you very much. Thank you. And turning next to, to Italian uh, writer and publisher Francesco Verso. Hi, everybody. Uh, pleasure to meet you. And thanks for inviting me to this virtual roundtable. Um, I'm Francesco Verso from Rome, and I've been uh, writing science fiction since more than 15 years. I wrote uh, uh, five novels. I won twice the National Italian Award, um, been translated in, the, in English and Chinese. Um, then after seven, uh, six, seven years, 
um, I started also um, a small press um, called Future Fiction, where I've uh, uh, collected and scouted the best science fiction authors from all over the world. And in uh, seven years, we've uh, collected more than 150 stories uh, from 20 countries and nine different languages. And we just won the European Best Publisher Award at the Eurocon in Belfast. Um, so we're dealing with uh, uh, science fiction and translation and the problem of uh, uh, the biodiversity of the future, as I call it. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you, Francesco. Uh, as for myself, I'm Jean-Louis Bedel in uh, Quebec City, Canada. I've been a longtime writer, started around 1984 in, in Canada, and have published a number of uh, 30 something books, uh, over 100 short stories since then, mostly in French, some of them in English, uh, recently in Asimov's in, at the beginning of the year. And I have a background in the sciences, uh, degrees in physics and astronomy, but I did my PhD in history. So I have a kind of uh, uh, varied view on uh, the, the future, the possibilities of the reboot, and so on. So Having said that, and being as, like the others, very glad to be here today virtually with the um, fans and virtual attendees of Miss Fiction, I'm going to uh, introduce the, today's uh, topic uh, to some extent. So back in 2017, the French uh, science fiction community um, gathered and united behind a, an appel de l'imaginaire. So a, basically a manifesto for the imagination, for imaginaries, and which stated that every morning we wake up with news that could have come directly out of a science fiction novel written 30 years ago. And of course, I think that uh, this year, 2020, has already seen um, <laughs> various uh, manifestations of this whether we're looking at uh, the fires in Australia early in January, a, a, a harbinger of uh, global climate change, whether we are looking at the pandemic that has affected all of our countries to a different extent, uh, or whether we are looking at, let us say, the um, political movement around the globe uh, that has mobilized to denounce uh, racism in uh, the U.S. and elsewhere as well. So the oft-used theme of science fiction has become a new uh, global reality, one that uh, certainly, um, ha certainly science fiction has saw things coming. And while I'm perhaps going to, I'm going to start, kind of maybe start with a quick, uh, a quick round question around the table as to whether you think that science fiction saw things coming, um, and I'm going to get my own point of view at the end. And after that, we'll move on to the reboot and reset questions. How do we approach the day after? But first, did science fiction see these things coming? And uh, feel free to remind people of works they may not know. Let's start with Guillaume. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess uh, lots of writers have uh, in some way or another uh, written about uh, catastrophic events, um, as you said, like the ones we've seen uh, for the past uh, years, uh, not only this one, but also the one before that. Uh, be it um, climatic uh, catastrophes or uh, virus spread, um, be it, uh, I don't know, Stephen King or, uh, yeah, the, I don't have anyone else that comes to mind, unfortunately, but yeah, I guess there are multiple ex examples. Uh. Tayo, do you want to tackle this? Yeah. Uh, the science fiction writer, the science fiction, uh, the science fiction researcher can imagine the people directly in the imagining and the touching and the, the tangible, the tangible things. 
in the future directory for the audiences of all the readers, then uh, at the, we are not basically the predictor. We don't expect the future directory, but the, but the, our work will imagine the next generations, the engineer or the agriculture person or the, the artist or so. Then I think the, our, the science fiction writer can change the world, the, not the directory, the expecting the future, but also the, we can change, we can the, so, throwing the ideas to or the idea or the inspector inspectation for the audiences. For example, um, I want to I want to let the people to aware about many government started the basic universal basic income during this pandemic. Yeah. We get the money from government. Many person get the money from government. But before this pandemic, every government say that we cannot do the we cannot do the universal basic income. But we know that it is possible. Then we can make uh, well so 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 we can make many story or narratives that that if the basic income is coming to the world, then uh, we can make the many stories and we can make many simulations or the make, uh, can, we can write descriptions. Okay. Then, and the, we can change the state of the poverty or the power or so with the starting from the basic income. Then I have the idea about the basic income can change the the high, the ex, expect, ex, expensive sir, uh, fee fair work for the, not for the handling the money person, but also the, we should pay the society, society should pay the expensive fee for the dangerous worker or also. If the universal basic income is working, then people is not necessary to work for the life, then the dangerous work would be the expensive work. Then changing, exchanging the, the hierarchy of the work, I think there, then this is a, uh, this is a one, the one example of the idea then, but the science fiction can throw the idea in the some story or narratives. Then I'm, because, be, this is because I'm writing science fiction. Well, thank you. Okay. We'll we'll uh, we'll come back to basic yeah. income. I think it's something that all <laughs> many countries have discussed and are and many people are discussing right now. Yeah. Um, coming back to my original question, Francesco, did you wanted to did you want to add anything? Yeah, um, I think basically science fiction can work uh, in two ways. One is to mirror reality, and the other one is to criticize reality. So. Um, over the last uh, hundred years, uh, we've seen a range of stories going from, from dystopia to utopia. So basically, if you know enough science fiction story, you can basically fish everything up out of the pool of the imagination of science fiction writers. So Jeff Koons wrote a story where there is a virus called Wuhan 4000. <laughs> So you call it prediction? Well, <laughs> it's it's out of the imagination of writers, and uh, basically the post-apocalyptic uh, um, scenarios that come out come out of the um, Cold War and the, the 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 fear of the nuclear power of the of the fifties and sixties. So nothing new under the horizon. Uh, what I would like to mention is the fact that uh, uh, science fiction works as a counteract. Uh, so, in a way, when the situation is particularly good and wealthy, we try to work out something that might go wrong. And, um, for example, the new wave uh, of the 60s and the 70s were saying, look, maybe this kind of development isn't really the best 
uh, of the possible futures. Maybe we're not to, taking into account the climate and nature and all the uh, um, expenses and uh, the externalities that we're dumping onto the environment. And uh, now that things are going so bad that uh, really cyberpunk is, the, uh, is a matter of just turning on your PC or uh, looking at the feed of Twitter, uh, then probably the narrative should go into more utopian style. So that's why I advocate solar punk, which is a kind of sustainable, uh, cooperative um, way of looking at the future in a more optimistic uh, kind. Thank you, Francesco. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen and show a slide I prepared uh, for, for my own blog, uh, basically based on a sampling of uh, works, uh, science fiction works, mostly in English, um, dealing with pandemics. And let's try this right now. Okay. Let's see. Hmm? Can you see that? Not yet. <laughs> no? Ah. <laughs> uh, yeah. so I can describe it. Let me try. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Let, let us try this. Okay. How about that? No, uh, I think Are you bird. Bird. okay. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Something is coming. We can see the wicked uh, Yeah. We can mm -hmm. see budget. We can see it, but it's often, I don't think it's on the on the stream output. Yeah. But we can see yeah. it. Sure. Sure, sure. Oh, interesting. Oh, <laughs> now it's gone. Oh. Yeah. I'll go. A pie chart or a bar chart? <laughs> Did you see? What I tried to show is basically that in the last decade, um, mm -hmm. according to my sampling, there's been a huge upsurge of work um, involving pandemics. A large share of that has to do with basically the zombie stories that have been so popular over the last 10 years. But it does feel like science fiction to, uh, was part of a kind of a feedback loop, a resonance chamber, where the idea, where the observation of real pandemics of the last 20 years, you can think of SARS and Zika and others, um, fears of avian and swine flu, um, have been also amplified by warnings such as by people from doctors or even Bill Gates as to the imminence of a pandemic. And science fiction was responding to that with this huge increase in pandemic stories. Um, obviously, science fiction doesn't predict, say, what year something will happen. But I think that um, just looking at the evidence for, in this particular case, you see a kind of call to arms of some, of the collective, you say, you could say, a mind of science fiction over the last ten years, and one might one might say that if uh, people had read more science fiction, they might have been better prepared. But it's not a matter of you know be, being able to predict uh, the date of an event, but the reality of an event is something that science fiction is sometimes able to point at, and we could we could probably do the same thing with global warming as something that has come up in science fiction. Having said that, um, let us uh, turn to the question of the reboot. And already we've heard from uh, Tayo about basic income and uh, from uh, Francesco about the uh, solar punk and its proposals for the future. So the original panel description um, went on to say, how should we approach the day after Will this global crisis open a window of opportunity leading to an altered, better future? So we know, I think, um, how to build, or at least we have some ideas that we've heard already, how to build a better future. But will we do, will we do it? So now, um, perhaps I'll, I'll do the reverse, start with Francesco and then through Tayo and then to Gio. Mm -hmm. So, oh, hi. To um, yeah. Well, it's it's a difficult question, <laughs> really difficult question, <laughs> because of course uh, the responsibilities of these uh, are, are widespread, are a kind of global um, response, which 
um, involves a, a level of cooperation and, and transformation which we, we don't really know what will happen. Of course, there is a, a, um, a discontinuity in this moment. Um, my point is that we have three options. Uh, one is to uh, delete, cancel the things that were really, really wrong uh, up to today. Uh, the second is change the things that didn't really work well. And the third is, of course, keep on doing the things that were correct. Um, I don't know which percentage of the three options we will manage to, to, to do, but uh, um, from a science fiction point of view, I think uh, um, we have to change na the narrative. I, I think that, uh, as you've shown with the number of uh, post-apocalyptic or, you know, dystopian... Just the pandemic. Oh, just the pandemic. I think that <laughs> that is not really what I would call science fiction in a sense that that is more like uh, the mainstream trying to sell over and over again the same uh, plot or the same theme, right? So you're going into really commercial stuff which is over abused and it's getting, you know, the same old thing. Um, so we should really try to work more on the um, possible solution on the on the on the um, trying to to use our imagination not uh, for what we know but to explore what we might achieve so there is a level of risk in the kind of in in, a, in a exploring different narratives um, I think we have to dare more uh, if we just uh, try to copy the past we will have the same outputs um, and uh, to, to do that um, of course, we need to work on some indexes. Uh, we need to include diversity. We need to include different voices in the uh, talk, in the global conversation that has not been included before. So just by looking at what's going on now in, in, in the US, you realize that you know, there's been a problem with the minority, but uh, what about the minorities in languages? We are now talking in English. But what about all the conversations that are being invisible because they go on on a different language? Uh, we have to work on radical inclusivity. Uh, this is one point. And uh, we, of course, have to work on the sustainability of the, and, uh, the energy and the transportation and the, way, the whole way we, we are building our cities. Uh, of course, this is a, a very big issue, but um, I'll cut it short here. Tell you? Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay the, uh, it is very big problem and big issue for uh, big issue and big difficult question. And uh, basically, uh, I'm I totally agree with Francesco's idea about uh, we are the keeping the diversity and the making the, the sustainability also. And uh, the solar punks and his solar punk, solar punk movement is very good for the, the making the good idea, throwing the good idea for the society. But uh, not but uh, yeah. And the I want to uh, the good or bad this pandemic the cuts the physical movement from uh, from us and uh, we should gather with using the battery like this to like this long round table then the, I, I think the the distance of our of us is shorter than before the pandemic right now then we can talk with the chinese friend easily rather than under under the we talk with a Chinese friend rather frequency rather than the before pandemic, and I'm the, the communicating with uh, another the European friend and the American friend before pandemic. Then that means that we are connecting with uh, we are connecting with virtually in yeah virtually in the uh, during this uh, quarantine terms then the virtual doesn't mean is uh, doesn't mean uh, virtual have the meaning of the the substances not only the not only the yeah 
the instead of but also substances then the virtual the virtual mean we we are i think that we are going we are going to change the virtual means to the substances the real another real things alter, not only the alternative but another real thing then then the this uh after this pandemic the we uh, we can to connect communicate with another the writers ideas easily and we can we can have the seminar under this round table more to frequency frequent frequency rather than the before and audience can watch the many ideas every weeks we cannot <laughs> we can we cannot attend every weeks uh, Every, uh, we cannot uh we couldn't attend to the the every weeks of the yeah, for the the con con conventions but the many japanese uh, science fiction fan is uh, attending for the the online <laughs> the conventions every week and the reporting then i'm i'm enjoying for reading their reports and that the, the then the this is a uh, not the part not is uh, not and this is not the answer but the communicating and the the make the discussing will change the was that the not directly but the alternate alternate and the making the base movement of the making uh, keeping the diversity or the listening to other ideas thank you you okay yeah, uh, well, to um, <laughs> I think the uh, the answer uh, to this huge uh, question is gonna in big part depend on how we look at uh, uh, how the pandemic came to be. Uh, is it just bad luck, or is it a direct consequence of uh, all our action on a global scale? And um, I think there there is going to be two narratives, uh, one uh, that's going to say, OK, it's just uh, it happens once in a while, and uh, we can continue as we do and uh, hope everything goes fine, or one that says, uh, let's look at uh, how we treat the world, and um, can we continue doing that uh, in the same way? Um, I guess uh, investing in education is always a safe bet. Uh, it's always been more uh, scientists we have, uh, the better prepared we are for uh, the unprepared. And maybe having um, some sort of hard look at the way uh, technology is intertwined with uh, profits uh, would probably be a good question to raise on a democratic scale, uh, which supposes also to have uh, people informed uh, in uh, the best way possible. Uh, The part of the question is has to do also with uh, our optimism, you could say, for the next uh, few years. The question of you know how we see the pandemic is indeed uh, kind of crucial because at, there is a level at which the pandemic is interconnected with our other crises, whether it's uh, uh, increasing population, global warming, um, and uh, kind of the inequalities of the economy and you can look at all of that and see it ha see it happening in real time um, the pressures put on the environment uh, has been increasing our contacts with various reservoirs and viruses global warming has been expanding you could say the climate zones in which certain tropical disease will flourish and the increasing population also uh, leads to more people being in more places uh, at the same time through and through technology. Uh, sometimes the same people are going to be in different places at the same time um, are almost at the same time, thanks to planes and so on. So all of this is interconnected and uh, the solutions um, the solutions have to be, I, can, I think, multiple. You've got to look at the ways to uh, manage population growth. You've got to look at the ways to reduce economic inequalities. You've got to look at the ways to 
reduce the pressure on the environment and also to slow down global warming. So a single answer is not enough. Um, can we can we do all of that at the same time? Can we um, only or can should we uh, choose a priority and stick with it? Um, I don't think the discourse is there yet. But I one thing I do think about the current situation is that what we've seen in certain uh, relatively wealthy countries is a perhaps greater capacity for collective action and solidarity that a lot of people did not expect. Um, there were fears in the United Kingdom that the population would say revolt if you tried to tell it to stay at home for an extended period of time. And the British conservatives were surprised by the uh, discipline of the population. Perhaps because as was, as was seen, they themselves are not particularly disciplined. Um, but <laughs> the looking at, uh, looking at many countries, we've seen the populations agree and, uh, with relatively little, you could say, uh, force from the authorities to kind of respect the discipline of lockdown, of confinement, and so on. And this gives me hope that um, having seen this capacity for collective action and solidarity, um, we'll be able to mobilize to do other things, perhaps indeed to agitate, well, to agitate for uh, greater racial equality right now, but perhaps tomorrow it's going to be to uh, mobilize for universal a universal basic income, or indeed, uh, and uh, and so on. Does anybody want to uh, react? Yeah, but I, I think that these these um, let's say um, rules or way be way of behavior came from from the state. So in a way, you have the authority imposing these kind of regulations or you know uh, what is permitted and what is not so uh, yes I agree with you that this is uh, a positive sign we didn't see revolts in like a hundred states um, but because people were scared so if you if you if you you know wave the the flag of of death or of sickness or you know this 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 pandemic it's it's probably easier to 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 collect this um, global behavior under the same flag, but what if it's universal basic income? Uh, that's a totally different thing. That's uh, in another field. It's not in the fear. It's in the hope. So I'm a little bit more, um, you know, skeptical about that. And I think we should have. As Guillaume said, more education. More education uh, makes the people more aware of of the right solutions. Uh, so probably, as Taji also said, we have been giving the idea, the very concept of work, too much value, and so we should probably work less, but work more, as more more in the sense more people, as as the French are doing. I hope you're still doing it, and I'm, I'm, I'm following that. But the working week is reducing, I think. So we should try to move to that slowly. It's not, it's not a fast and or you know a switch you can do it like that. But um, I think with minor adjustments, you will get um, to a better figure. I think, as um, Francesco said, um, uh, it's a specific kind of uh, crisis we have on our hands right now uh, and it moves really fast so as all crises you see uh, great acts of compassion and also uh, unfortunately uh, acts of selfishness um, but uh, for the uh, bigger issue of uh, climate change and global warming um, the atrocity is not uh, on the same time scales it takes a lot longer, uh, generations, and um, will people be able to uh, transfer uh, what they've learned or what they've seen during this uh, 
short scale time crisis to a larger scale and um, and look uh, look at the bigger picture. Uh, let's say it like that. Uh, We need we need more yeah, psycho yeah. history like uh, Asimov and Foundation, you know. <laughs> uh, sure. Are you? But uh, sooner, uh, but, yeah. But sooner or later, there, there, our, uh, our government and medical uh, medical teams should uh, should to make the standard standardizing the information of the, our using about the pandemics. Yeah, then the every country uses uh, different the local definition of the word right now, but in the uh, half century years ago, then airplane industries started to use the same word, same definition all over the world in order to the degree things that the airplane accident accidental then the airplane travel tra uh, air, uh, the travel with using the airplane is very safe rather than the another all other uh transport transporting because then all the country and the, all the airplane maker and all the air commuting companies started to standardize and communicating well and using the same forms of the same forms and the same the using the same word and i think that after this pandemic we should make the same the uh the infection the medical words all, all over the world like this then i think the communication will start again soon i think it is necessary because the pandemic and virus is not a local local issue then that communication will bring us to another bring us to the another the deeper communication terms i think i believe it that will change okay hmm? okay okay hey. I've gotten um, different uh, feedbacks as to how much time we have. We started late, so uh, Sibyl is telling me we might yeah, have yeah, sure. 5.45. Um, but um, I just had a voice in my head, my head uh, saying that we might only have 15 more <laughs> minutes. So um, I'm going to go right away to, the, to a, what might have been my last question, but if not, we'll, if I have, if we get more time, I'll, we'll work back a bit. But, the one of the last questions was going to be uh, how is the science fiction community itself impacted by say the current crisis and or hopes for a reboot and do you think that science fiction is going to affect the debate um, and here hey, this might be a chance to hear from your own viewpoints of your own localities your your own countries. <laughs> well, I, I, okay. <laughs> okay. I read yesterday that on Twitter that um, Amazon Amazon Prime they kind of labeled the the science fiction genre the the most copied from reality. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, they they just uh, branded science fiction as the most uh, copied genre from reality. Um, that that says a lot. Um, it means that uh, in a way we won. <laughs> um, we are now the, um, the one of the fiber of reality, um, which uh, in another way scares me because you know all these stories uh, where we basically destroy the world thousands of times <laughs> and, and rebuild it uh, uh, and uh, so it could could be you know could really really be true well um, but to, to to answer um, uh, let's say the question is that we we've been affected deeply affected uh, uh, let's say 
all conventions have been cancelled. Uh, we cannot go anywhere. We cannot gather anymore. Uh, book fairs have been uh, all delayed or cancelled. Um, we've seen a, a well a fair you know drop in sales, um, whether it's printed books or e-books. Uh, personally, all my conventions and trips and journeys to many different countries have been completely wiped out. And uh, on the other side, I'm doing a lot of <laughs> online <laughs> conventions and doing online courses and workshops and seminars and all the things. So I've learned a lot. I've learned to use many different tools which I really didn't know nothing about. And um, uh, this all together, I'm trying to uh, take this moment uh, as, as as a learning moment uh, because because I'm not because I I'm, I consider myself privileged, and uh, so I I want to use this moment to try to um, then um, uh, inject uh, some kind of uh, energy to the into the way we will tell stories into the way we will select the stories, into the way we scout stories. Uh, this is, you know, my, my, my long time battle for, 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 you know, diversity, for inclusivity, uh, for translations. Um, so I think uh, even though I've seen at the latest Worldcon some movement in this direction, I think the conversation must go uh, much faster and much stronger into into the inclusivity because never forget that we always talk about English or US uh, science fiction most of the time, most of the time really. And at panels and in different conversations we have to include different voices that, uh, that don't get to even talk or tell their stories because they're not being translated. Uh, so this is really important. I think uh, we have to invest more and more into translations uh, not just from one language but from different languages and we don't have to use also just the English as a bridge from one language to the other. My friend Tayo, I want to translate him directly from Japanese to, to uh, Italian. My friend Jean-Louis Trudel, I want to translate from French to Italian even though he writes in English, I know, but <laughs> the point is that we should uh, consider the original language as a, as a preciousness, not as an obstacle. We should try to change the way we look at the language. Language is, a, is, a, is a, the treasure of our identity, is where our traditions and culture and history uh, uh, flourished. So we should not uh, standardize everything uh, just to cope with the English standard or the American standard of the market. We have to use more translations. And that ended here. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out we'll have a bit more time. So, but first I'll, we'll, I'll, keep, I'll go to uh, Guy, I'll go to Tayo if um, you want to tackle this uh, double barreled question about the impact on science fiction and on uh, perhaps uh, the question of whether um, science fiction is going to affect the, the, the coming debates. Yeah, uh, the fortunate reader, I'm living in Japan, the east end of the east end of the Eurasian continent, then the 9,000 kilometers away from the Nice or the Italy, the Nice or the yeah, the French, Italian or the, so, and Canadian is. Uh, more further, and then, but I can communicate with you with using the midnight time after the the homework and the discussing about the science fiction affection. Yeah, it is very the worth for a very very good time for me and and my to, my discussion is the thrown to the Japanese audiences and uh, they got courage and uh, enc they encourage I think they encourage about the uh, Japanese writer can uh, speaking about something to the world then yeah. and the Chinese writer also then yeah. I think there I know that on 
during this uh, quarantine quarantine days that I'm the, the attending and discussing on the the virtual convention is a uh, my uh, is a uh, very good timing for the making the another ties the with the beyond to the attending on the real conventions i only can attend the five or five or the seven real convention for a year but the virtual convention but but the the, the twice or the third times of the convention uh i can i can attend the virtual com uh, if the if those are the if those convention are virtually or online health then and uh, then the, the communicating and attending on the convention is uh, very easier than before pandemic. It is very good. Then I want to use these opportunities. Yeah. And and fortunately, I have time to the write short stories and uh, novels. Then I'm going to write the short stories once and uh, sending the drafts to the many countries. <laughs> and expanding it then right now that i just published uh, my the, i think that my representing uh short story on the wire japan about the post pandemic novel uh, post pandemic novelette <laughs> short story but uh, i think that um, i'm going to the on the chinese publisher will publish uh in next month and uh, i'm going to send the uh, this draft to the United States and the Francisco <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and another country's editors. Then, then expanding by by by, by the, the translation offer is working right now. Then the, this pandemic, uh, this the quarantine the days is. Uh, there are, I think there another meaning incubating days for the writer's work, I think. We are going to uh, I, then I I'm going to share my idea and uh, I'm I'm on my action for the Japanese writers. Okay. Thank you, Guillaume. Uh, yeah, um, well, I guess there's uh, obviously, like uh, all my colleagues said, the immediate impact on uh, the science fiction uh, conventions and publication that's uh, obvious to all of us. And uh, more uh, globally, also on all the uh, cultural events, uh, be it uh, music, uh, concerts. Uh, I come from a, a musician background and uh, all my uh, all my friends are at the moment uh, unemployed uh, until the concerts can start again. Uh, same for cinema, uh, which uh, can't shoot a movie at the moment. So um, yeah, the pandemic has uh, I think made obvious to everyone that uh, culture uh, represents a huge part of uh, our economy and uh, our uh, lives. As for the influence on my writing, I guess that there will be one, but I will have to digest the, uh, the pandemic crisis first. I think I'm still too uh, too deep into it, and I think it will take some time to uh, to see how, uh, how it affects me. And uh, I think it will take some time to uh, for everybody to uh, to really realize uh, what just happened. Um, it's a big change. Having everybody uh, at home for about three months is not something I thought I would see uh, during my lifetime. So um, I guess it will take a, a bit of time to uh, to get my head around it. Um, um, and for the uh, the other question about the uh, impact of uh, science fiction on the um, on the reboot or reset or whatever you call it. Uh, I don't know what kind of uh, impact we can have. I hope a good one. I hope we can promote uh, kindness. Um, I think that's the yeah maybe the uh, the only thing that uh, comes to mind is uh, try 
to uh, to promote kindness uh, in any way possible because it's uh, easy to describe a world that's falling apart. Uh, it's more difficult, I think, to uh, to uh, imagine one where everybody uh, unites and uh, and start something together. Thank you. Um, as for myself, um, I'm also impressed by how right this year we have countries around the world experiencing a the same event basically with very multiple local forms and, and and variations but still it is a kind of common experience linking linking many of us at the same level um, it's at the you some countries have only say uh, introduce a few restrictions. Some countries stayed at home for weeks. But it, it strikes me that um, it's been one of the few events lived on a global scale, uh, more or less simultaneously, that we've seen in a long time. Um, you have events like the Olympics that once upon a time tried to do that, but are, of course, were, of course, very limited to the sports, to sports. And now we have a common experience that has linked us. And I think it is perhaps also why it becomes suddenly easier to speak to each other about science fiction or about other topics. And I hope it kind of continues. Obviously, as we see today, um, there are technical difficulties that make it uh, challenging to, to communicate. But still, I think it's, it does open doors that were um, closed either by our own routines, daily routines, or by the fact that, well, if we go to a science fiction convention, we go to the nearest one, obviously, and we don't necessarily think about reaching out to a, uh, to a science fiction convention on another continent, and vice versa. So for, that's a kind of a, my human observation. As for science fiction, well, uh, I think science fiction is perhaps going to be even more driven um, to kind of look at better futures um, with solar punk or with other uh, flavors of uh, optimistic uh, science fiction. But science fiction usually kind of wants to uh, look at the next step. So it may well be that uh, <laughs> pandemics are not going to be what people what science fiction writers are going to be thinking about, and it may even be that the reboot reset, if we're going to be living it in real time for the next couple of years, is not going to be something that surfaces in science fiction. Science fiction usually tries to look at the next step. Um, so we'll, at the very least, I expect a kind of uh, a balance. There will be stories looking at uh, the reboot, the reset, and there may be stories kind of looking at the next step, whether it is dealing with global warming or something else. Will science fiction affect the reboot, the reset? Well, I'm among the people who would like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, among the pe I'm among the people who think that, uh, yes, uh, efforts like uh, Francesco's um, are worth following, and uh, the whole solar pump movement has been uh, putting forward some ways of looking at this. I now have two questions from the audience. Um, the first question is for Francesco, and um, somebody who's asking about the plurality university. Are you aware of, of this plural, pl plurality university? Are you part of it? Because what you were saying struck the person in the audience as being very similar and very close to that plura plura plurality university. A university, a plurality a university. Of, that's the name I've I, been given. Given. I'm the founder. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> one of the founder. We have the headmaster here. <laughs> well, then it's you, man. <laughs> plurality University is a virtual university held by the the Paris organization, and the many the science fiction writer and artist and the the uh, yeah activist. The gathers and are having the workshop. The two years ago, uh, two years ago, yeah, two years ago, no, uh, November, 
and、uh, is going to have the second the meeting at、uh, uh, at Amsterdam this month this May, but couldn't have it. Okay, well, then. Then I have a complaint. I haven't been invited, man. <laughs> 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 they, they they started to publishing the magazine right now, and they have the many interesting issues right now. And and、uh, I didn't have the time to write about.、Uh, yeah,、uh, I didn't contribute, it, but yeah, yeah. But、uh, their yeah. working their work is, is very interesting, and、uh, I want to, yeah. Okay, I will invite you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me let me just let me just add something. Yeah, okay. Which, which makes、sure. uh, the the wh why I'm doing this.、Uh, of course,、um, the 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 concept that I've applied is、uh, the biodiversity. So we all know about the the biodiversity, the risk、uh, we all run. But I apply this concept to to science fiction in the way that、uh, if you consider. Uh, all the other genre, there is of course a dependency from the English language, okay?、Uh, but it's not so big as it is in science fiction. So I imagine this: what would happen if we all give up our our language, our identity? I was uh, uh, once in a panel、uh, the, in France at the Utopial, and、uh, there was an English writer, and he said、uh, to improve our our region, national markets, we should all write in English. I said. Sorry, but <laughs> why should I give up my name and、uh, call myself Frank towards instead of Francesco Verso? Just because now you have, you know, the lingua franca of the world.、Um, I think I'm entitled to write in my language.、Uh, then it's a matter of market to、um, discover who are the best authors in the world. Problem is that the market is not really. Doesn't really care about quality of the books, but they care about marketability and the economy of the books themselves. So I, I, I thought, how many books do we lose? How many masterpieces? How many excellent writers do we lose because they are not being translated? Just because they are not born on the right side of the Atlantic Ocean, let's say, you know, the U.S., but of course it could be the the. the The UK as well.、Um, so this is why I've、uh, come up with this、uh, small, really small project to give voice to underrepresented、uh, languages and cultures and countries. And、uh, I, I just, I, I just mentioned this. Think about how how much time it takes for、uh, a very important book coming from the US or UK to be translated in ten or fifteen languages. And think about how much time it takes for the other way around, for a book that is probably written in French or German or Spanish to be translated in English. It could be a long time. It could be most of the times never. <laughs> so this is the this is the reality we live in in science fiction, and、uh, I I think we should do something about that. Thank you. The other question, I think, it's a pretty good、uh, closing question from、uh, my my、mm -hmm. friend Kitty Stewart, and basically she's asking all of us which of our works show the how to invent a better a better future. So, which of our works are you would recommend perhaps、uh, to a reader for understanding how to build a better future? I think Taiyu already pointed out、uh, some of his books. But、uh, this might be a chance to uh, for uh, Francesco and Guillaume and I'll be and myself to name some of our some of our own stories.、Uh, Guillaume,、uh, is there anything you would want to recommend?、Um, I don't have a, such a long、uh, bibliography, uh, so uh, it's uh, yeah uh, maybe a challenge for me to、uh, to recommend anything. I, I, Actually, published a short story in uh, uh, Galaxy. I think it was two years ago in the uh, digital uh, supplement that was called Watchmaker, and、uh, that was about a world where,、um, from one day to the next, there is no more oil at all.、Uh, it follows some kind of war or something like that, and um, um, the main. The protagonist is actually a trade、uh, 
uh, stock trader, which was specialized in, uh, in petrol. So what does he do the next day? How does he keep on uh, doing what he does, trading if there's no oil? And I think that's something that some people uh, have probably asked themselves uh, during this uh, pandemic, since the uh, price of the crude has gone <laughs> below zero at some point. So um, yeah, it's kind of a funny story, I think. Um, it, it just follows one man and uh, his reflection on uh, how to uh, cope with uh, something as big as uh, losing all you thought was important and realizing that maybe it was not that important. Francesco, Tayo. Well, I'm, I've uh, written uh, a solar punk novel, of course. <laughs> so um, it's <laughs> it's it's my take. Uh, well, it's it's about it's a story about a bunch of people that, uh, through the use of nanotechnology and uh, artificial photosynthesis and 3D printing, they decide that uh, living in the city is not worthwhile anymore. So they decide to abandon their lifestyle and uh, start to repopulate abandoned places that were uh, deserted uh, during the last centuries where people were going to live in the city for the dream of the urban lifestyle. Uh, I believe that the urban lifestyle has reached a peak in the last 30 years. So in the cities we are not experiencing any higher quality of uh, life uh, standards. Um, so um, maybe we should uh, go back and find a different balance in our in our uh, in, in our standards of living, uh, let's say. And for the record, the title of that book would be. Oh, it's uh, the Walkers. It's it's not been it's it, it's been published in Italian, and I'm going to translate that in English. Uh, the I Caminatori, but it's uh, the Walkers in English. Thank you. Thank you. As for myself, I'm well. It's. Uh, a lot of my book-length science fiction was more space opera, uh, so basically I have to look to my short stories, and a lot. Some of them are more warnings about the future than um, models. But I have a couple of stories. One of which appeared in a French uh, solar punk uh, anthology called uh, "Dimension Avenir Radio," and um, still available available online, I believe, uh, if you order and which it tries to imagine a world of, first of all, a world of globalized law. Um, and this is something that has, uh, that I've sometimes thought about as, even though we've seen with the current crisis a return to national, sometimes jurisdictions, um, I sometimes do, I have thought for a long time that um, and it might be necessary for a better world that a better world start by being one world in some form. Uh, maybe we need a another level of, I, won't, I don't want to say world government, but maybe world law, and a world law that uh, would be applicable everywhere. And so there's a bit of that in that sort of story, and there's a bit of that in another story that appeared in my uh, fiction collection, um, Les Marais à venir. That one is sadly out of print, but I'm trying to get it back in, into print. So we're basically very close to or ending to the end of this uh, panel discussion. And so I'm going to solicit you for some final words, if you have any. And uh, then, I'll thank, then I'll thank all of you and wrap it up. So any final words? Guillaume? Oh, well, I hope I'll see you uh, in person in the future, and uh, we can meet uh, at some point. That would be nice. Yeah, yeah me too. Oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I believe that all the writer was changed around this uh, pandemic days. Then let me read your stories, even shorter. <laughs> Longer, yeah. Let me le let me read your stories. I won't read it. That will change the world, I think. Hmm. You'll be overwhelmed by stories, man. <laughs> yeah, of course I will write and uh, publish. 
good, good. Yeah, it's the same. I'm really um, honored to be here, and uh, I hope to see you somewhere uh, in some science fiction convention. Um, this is a good way to keep uh, ourselves, our community together, and uh, thank for the organization. Um, we should uh, probably have this on a regular basis, maybe organize it on a, on a regular basis to try to, you know, cope with the times that are coming, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll conclude by once again thanking everybody, thanking the partners of Miss Fiction, thanking the organizers of Miss Fiction for inviting all of us. It's been a very enjoyable uh, talk and there are many points that were made that uh, I certainly fully agree with. Uh, translation is something that I've uh, been engaged in between French and English for many years. Uh, and I think I started basically back in the 1990s. And it's nice to see many, many more efforts all around the world uh, to get science fiction from different languages known in other languages. I think uh, it's, yes, uh, we can't just rely on English being the common thread. We got to also kind of discover the languages that uh, we can't read. We, I can, I can try struggle through a bit of Italian, but I, I, I don't think I'd be able to read an entire book and I would certainly not get the flavor of the language. And there are over 5,000 languages, so we've got to find other solutions. We can't all learn <laughs> all 5,000 languages. So on that note, I think um, I'll uh, conclude and invite the tech people to <laughs> maybe put an end uh, to the discussion. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll say goodbye. Bye-bye. Ciao. Ciao. Au revoir. Ciao. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. A bientôt. Cette table ronde vient de se terminer, mais le festival continue tout le week-end. Le programme complet est disponible sur nice-fiction.fr. Les stands vous attendent sur notre serveur Discord. Pensez également à visiter nos expositions 3D et n'hésitez pas à intervenir dans le chat des conférences et tables rondes si vous avez des questions.